Good evening. This lecture, Leilui Nishmat Shaili Yael Bat Moran, Rafael Ben Tsipor Asima, Levi Leon Leib Itzchak Ben Meir, Rina Batichie Eliyahu Ben Borcho. And also, Lerefua Shlema of Miriam Bat Mazal and Binyamin Ben Sophia Sara. And also, להצלחת יעקב, מרים, נעמי, בני יפה, דיאנה. טוב, ברוך השם, it's wonderful news today, the wicked, evil government of Israel finish their story today. They announced another election in October. That's the good news. The bad news that the Hader, the number one hater of Hashem and hater of the Torah, Lapid, is going to be a prime minister for four months. Four months is a long time to destroy what's left from Israel. Already destroyed so much. He can take advantage on him knowing he's only going to be temporarily a prime minister and he's going to write a lot of checks to his Arab friends and to the gays and will make all kinds of other decrees against the religion, obviously knowing he's not going to stay there, he's going to try to hurt as much as he can. Just like they did the entire year, but now it's going to be worse, because when they still were in power, they were cautious. Now he has nothing to lose. So we really hope to, to survive those four months, and if we did, then we have to wait for a miracle that the next government will be ready. It will be again like the other elections that they have a tie and they cannot form a government. We're back to square one and it's a disaster. Before I start, the, the topic of tonight is every year before the, before the beginning of the year in Israel, we always find out there are hundreds of girls, Sephardi girls, who cannot find the yeshiva. Why? Racism continue. Nothing is new. They continue with the racism. They already, the owners of the seminars and the yeshivas, they say, we have already too many Sephardi girls. We don't want too many percentage of Sephardi girls. Like the Sephardi girls are maybe the goyot, maybe they have tsarats, the leprosy, maybe they are murderers. Maybe they're robbing banks, you know, the Sephardi girls are so dangerous, religious, nice, great girls. Just because their parents or grandparents came from Iraq or Morocco or Iran or Lebanon or Syria, they're already a second class citizen. Every year the same story. Every year they say we're going to put an end to it. The education uh, office of Israel say no, it cannot go on. It said that the wicked people that sit in the education system, that hate so much Torah and Hashem, they upset about these girls more than the owners of those seminars who call themselves rabbis. How sad it is that people that hate religion so much, they worry more for these girls to have a school than the people that own those seminars. You understand? Then the people ask, Rabbi, why Mashiach doesn't come? 600 girls, religious girls, do not have school for September 1st. Ah, every year the same story. For the last 20 years, I hear it every year. Every year around June, July, the same story. Very sad that there will be girls after all the noise and the politics and the articles on TV and all these things that show the ugly face of some religious people in Israel, after all of that, it will only help partially. There will still be hundreds of girls with no yeshiva. They're going to sit home two, three, four months without school. Why? Because their last name is Buzaglo or Mizrahi or any, any other name. If that's not a shame, what could be a shame, bigger shame than this? You understand? If you're talking about girls that are not religious, they can get accepted. They're not feeding the yeshiva. 
Yeshiva has requirement. You have to dress modest, you have to behave modest, you have to know Torah up to the level where you are, if you're 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, whatever you are. A secular girl that doesn't dress modest and watch TV and has all kinds of strange things about her, obviously she cannot come into the yeshiva regardless if she's Faradi or Ashkenazi. Every institution has their standards. And they are entitled to make their standards as long as it's equal for all Jews. Once it's for one, for one kind of Jews, there are leniency, and for the other kind, it becomes very difficult. That's a very big crime. And these people will be punished severely by Hashem. Severely. You know, again, if the girls are not good, they don't deserve to be accepted. Regardless who they are and what country they came from or their parents. But not, we're not talking about bad girls. We're talking 600 good girls. That they just, when they call, they don't even know who the girls are yet. They didn't check them out yet. As soon as they see their last name, so we're sorry, we already have enough Sfaradi girls in a, in a seminary or in yeshiva. That's what's happening. So it's so sad to hear such a thing, to see such a thing. It's mamash rip the heart to pieces. This is what's going on. One more thing, you know, there's a lot of uh, Israelis that they go to Turkey. There was a few years that the relationship between Israel and Turkey was very, very bad. Almost as bad as Israel and Iran. This Ardwan, the president of Turkey, saw that the Turkey paid a massive price, even in the time of Trump. He hurt his country very bad. Why? Because the connection of Turkey with the United States became very bad as a result of the relationship with Israel. So they wanted to get back in good track with America, so they started to become nicer to Israel. They threw out the Hamas, closed their office in Istanbul, they started to kiss up to the Israelis, and the Israelis have very short memory. Within a week or two, they forgot already all the bad things they did to us for years. And right away, shook their hands, and let's go back and be friends. Okay. When you become friends with them, there are consequences. What are the consequences? Thousands of Israelis every month goes and fly to Turkey. Why they have to fly to Turkey? In the beginning, it was tourism. Israelis cannot sit in one place. They have to always go on vacation. They want to go on trips. The vacation in Israel are four or five times more expensive than Turkey. Turkey has a lot to offer. They have everything the secular Israeli is looking for. Beaches, hotels, they eat not kosher, so it's a lot of good meat. And everything is very cheap because the, the Turkish currency collapsed. You can buy everything there for peanuts. So a hotel, for instance, that will cost you $300 a night in Israel, over there costs you $40. Same room, $50. It started with tourism. Then they found out the Israelis, which half of them are bold, a lot of people are bold, that in Turkey for $2,000 you can fill up your entire head with transplant, include the hotel and the flight, $2,000. What would cost $10,000 in Israel or $15,000 in America, I don't know exactly the prices, you can do in Turkey by being there three, four days, the entire package, $2,000. So you combine a trip, tourism, while you're coming back with transplanting, they take from the neck, they transplant it to the front. I think you have to go there more than once, maybe twice. Eventually, within a year, you're supposed to have air growing. Thousands of Israeli went to Turkey to do air transplant. Once they already went to do hair transplant, they started to find out that everything else in Turkey is less than a quarter of a price, such as dental, root canal, quarter of a price, cleaning, quarter of a price, everything there is a quarter of a price, clothing, quarter of a price. So they decided, you know what, let's buy a flight, we we'll fly there for $200, fill up a suitcase with clothing. What we save on the clothing will cover the entire vacation. That's what they do. One more thing. 
there is a hospital there. In Israel, if you need to do an MRI, you have to have an MRI. You know, it's a social a medical, like Hussein Obama wanted to do, like Canada has. The only problem here in Canada, you get some treatment. In Israel, it's very hard to get a treatment, unless you bribe the doctor or the one who organized the appointment, it will take you a year to get an MRI. By then you'll be die, you will be dying 10 times. You die 10 times until they give you the appointment for the MRI. So what Israelis do, they have to go private. They have to pay for the MRIs. It's thousands of dollars. In Turkey, two, three hundred dollars, you're done with the whole thing. And you get it right away on the spot. So now you have thousands of Israeli who the doctor said to them, I have to give you a referral to MRI. That day they buy a ticket, they fly to Turkey, the next day they make the MRI, they get a CD with the MRI, they come back, here, here it is. Huh? How come? Here. From Istanbul, there's a Jewish hospital. Jewish hospital. All doctors that speak Hebrew. Better than the hospital that they have over there, that you have to wait a year. The Israeli government and the merchants, they don't like it. They lose all their customers. Everybody goes there. So what did they do? They started to say that there are Iranian terrorists walking around in Istanbul looking to murder Israelis. If it's true or not, I personally don't believe it. Maybe it is true, I don't know. It's hard to prove. I don't believe it. I think the reason they say it is to terrorize the Israeli, to get them scared that nobody wants to go to Turkey. Because they lose billions like this. If everybody goes to give the business to the other country, they, first of all, they have 17% tax on every item. Everything you buy in Israel, every service you get, you have to pay 17% to the Israeli government. So if you go to the hotel and you pay $300, 17% on top of it, it's mom, tax. That's $50 goes right there for one night, for every person. They make the fortune. Restaurant, 17%. MRI, doctors, this, everything you buy there, dental, whatever you do, you have to pay 17%. They lose it to Turkey. All the business go over there. How do you make Israeli get scared? Tell them Iranians are looking to shoot at you. They even published that the Israeli Mossad helped the Turkish to catch some Is Iranians that were ready to, to launch an attack. Who knows? Politics. Bottom line, Rabotai, that's, that's what's going on over there. They have short memory. You go, you give the business to those who just a few months ago called for our destruction. That's what they called for our destruction. One last thing and I start. You know, I don't know if you saw Sleepy Joe, poor Sleepy Joe. I felt bad for him. For the first time, I really felt bad for the guy. <laughs> Fell off his bike. Uh, I started to ask myself, why would an 80 years old man who doesn't remember his name and doesn't remember the path to his office in the White House continue to walk straight on the grass and doesn't remember in what state he's in when he comes to give a speech that he, he make a mistake. He's in Florida, I'd say, hello, Michigan. <laughs> so he's in the, in a, it's not such a good condition. Just like 80 years old people, not all of them are in good condition. That's the way it is. It is what it is. We're never going to be young forever. Why would a person like this to prove that he's forever young? Why does he need to go on a bike? To prove what? Why does he have to run up the stairs to the airplane? Remember how he fell a few times? Who are you trying to impress? We are not looking for a 25 years old president that knows how to run and jump and dunk the basketball. For that, we go to the stadium to look for athletes. We are looking for an old, responsible, smart president. So the older you are, as long as your brain works, it's wonderful. You have life experience. We are not expecting you to jog. We're not expecting you to ride uh, on a bicycle or I don't know, whatever you do. But I tell you what's behind it. Remember, everything you see, Hashem is talking to you through that.
everything you see. Whatever you see, whatever you hear, whether it's here, whether it's in Israel, whether the, the, the you know, everything you see in every moment, you have to try to analyze what's the message from Shamaim. And I'll tell you what's the message. The message is that the United States is collapsing big time. That's the message. That this country is going down the drain. I already spoke in the last two lectures about the horrible days that are coming. I don't want to repeat it again. But uh, when you see that the king of a country falls on the floor like this, and people have to help him to get up on his leg, that's a sign from Shamaim that HaKadosh Baruch Hu humiliates the kingdom of what used to be the greatest empire of the world. And you can see what's going on here. He had to beg King uh, Prince Salman from Saudi Arabia for four months to agree to, to, to accept him for an appointment. Four months he's begging him, please let me come to Saudi to meet with you. And that young uh, prince is the one who murdered that reporter. He sent the people to kill him. So in the beginning, Sleepy Joe thought he's going to put Saudi on their knees. Started to take actions against them. The Saudis realized that you cannot rely on the Americans. They became friendly with Israel and some other countries. Dumped America. Raised the prices of the oil to $120 a barrel. It's in their end, you know. Oil can go down tomorrow to $40. This, in spite of the war, if Saudi decide, and they just will announce, we will triple the amount of production. In one or two days, the oil prices will drop to $40 a barrel. Instead of paying six, seven, nine, uh, $10 a gallon, he'll pay $2 a gallon. Why we are paying so much? Because of the genius Sleepy Joe and his friends, the liberals decided to take Saudi Arabia, the best friends of America, after Israel, and turn them into an enemy because they murdered some reporter. Not that it's right to murder anyone that disagree with you, to murder him, it's not right. But that's, that's politics, it's all dirty. All countries do it, everyone is dirty. CIA kill even American citizens when they feel that it's national security. I hope that Israeli Mossad doesn't kill Israeli citizen. But someone from inside once told me if he's a danger to Israel, they will eliminate him as well. Why? The great cause the, of security of the country is above a specific citizen here and there. It can cause sometimes a huge damage to the country and many will die. They rather eliminate one than to deal with a thousand that will die. You understand? And I'm not getting into it now if it's, you can justify it according to halakha or not. Because the halakha said that if the goyim come to a Jewish town and they say to the Jews, give us Mr. X. They come with a name. We want to put him in prison. Why? He's guilty of such and such. You're allowed to take that Jew and give it to the goyim. Why? Because if not, they'll kill all of us. So you're allowed to turn him in. But what happens if the Goim say, we want to sacrifice one Jew to our God, to some idol. You give us one and we'll let you live. If you don't give us the one, we'll kill all of you. We'll kill 10,000. 10,000 Jews that lives in the city. Give us one, or if not, we'll kill all of you. What do you think will happen? What's the Torah say? You're allowed to give them one or no? Not allowed. What's the difference between the two cases? First case, they already came with a name. They will not leave you alone. They're after that person. With or without you, they'll take him. Why get into a fight with them that they'll kill all of us? Anyway, they're going to get him. With or without us. So why should we die for nothing? But now they want one. They didn't say which one. We don't have permission to choose who is going to die. There is a similar scenario. Sometimes a woman have IVF. And in IVF, usually they have twins or three, triplet. And sometimes it could be four babies. And sometimes the doctor said to the woman, you're not going to be able to give birth to three. We have to kill one. 
We have to abort one. The question is, how do you choose which one to abort? Do we have permission to decide which one of the three will live and which one will die? It's a big problem. Very big problem. If one falls naturally, okay. So it's very interesting. It's very hard questions, believe me. Sometimes it could be only one baby, but he risks the life of his mother. You may say the mother is 50 years old. That's her last delivery. What's better, that she will die and we save the baby, or the baby will die and the will save the mother? One has to die, either her or him. You may say, better save the baby. He's going to have long life. She's already 50. How long she's going to live? Another 30 years. But he has another eight years in front of him. Logically, we should save him. No. Why? Because he is the risk to the mother's life. She, she was alive. Everything was fine. And now a threat came. When a threat comes, you are allowed to remove the threat in any possible way. Someone who comes to kill you, even not intentionally, you have to kill him first. That's the rule. I'm, I'm sure the liberals will not agree with that. The liberals have their own Torah. They make up their own rules. But we follow what the creator of the world told us. Not what we feel is right. What Hashem feels is right. That's it. Once you have, uh, <laughs> you have uh, instructions what to do, what not to do, you can go wrong. You do what the Torah says and that's it. And you remove yourself from responsibility. So what happened? Hashem wanted to show us that the American Empire came to an end. That's it. Now the question is, how long it will take until everyone would realize it? So far, many countries already understand that. God forbid, I'm very worried because the Chinese and the Russians are talking about dumping the American dollar completely and moving to a different currency. You know what will happen to America if something like this will happen? <laughs> In order for you to buy a ticket to go to Israel, you're going to have to walk six months just for the ticket. The dollar will not have any value. Nothing. If you have to fly to Italy and you have to pay with Euro, the Euro may be worth $10. Because the dollar will crash. There's nothing. Shekel will be more than a dollar. What, what's going to happen? If you go overseas and you want to buy something, it will cost you so much, you won't be able to afford anything. Let's hope it's not going to get to it. So, there are a lot of you know, when all these things happen, who are they going to blame? The Jew. That's really the bottom line here. We, the Jewish people, will be blamed for it. You know, two days ago, someone sent me a picture that is running now on Facebook. What is the picture? One of the richest people in the world, Bill Gates, is standing online on the street in a shawarma wagon that they sell shawarma on the street. Not shawarma, a burger, hamburger, and french fries. People stand online. A person that worth $130 billion is standing online like a person in front of him who probably worth two and a half dollars. For the burger. And everyone in America are shocked from the humility. How humble is Mr. Gates that he doesn't send one of his servers to order him or to buy him the burger when he can sit in his palace and then can deliver it to his house. Stand, get out of his car and stand in the street where he lives, in the street somewhere in, on the sidewalk, online to buy a, a $10 meal. I want to ask you a question. Why so many people are so impressed that a person feels like he wants to eat burger with fries, like he used to do when he was poor? He misses it, so he wanted to buy himself a burger. Why everyone is so excited? What's behind it? Why so many millions of people are talking about Mr. Gates buying a burger? Why? Huh? Who knows what's behind it? Why everyone got so excited? What's the big deal? So a billionaire is a humble person. Why is so shocked? Well, it's not possible. What's 
a big deal. Okay, very nice, Mr. Gates. Here, thumbs up. Publicity to whom? I wasn't asking about him. I'm asking why so many people are so impressed. If you see me and you standing by the online, they're not going to be such a big deal, no? Why everyone is so excited that Gates wanted to eat a burger with french fries and, and a, a, a can of Coke? What's the big deal over here? What, they didn't think he eats it at home? What, just because he became a, b a billionaire, he doesn't like uh, the burgers or hot dogs or whatever? The answer is, Rabotai, is because it relaxes the jealousy of the people. Ah, it's not, his life is not that much greater than mine, like I thought. Look. I buy hot dogs, I buy burgers, and he buy burgers. What's really the difference between us? It comforts the jealousy. If you would see him standing and eating a $60,000 meal, like they show in Manhattan how they eat the rich and famous, and a bottle of wine is $20,000, and five waiters around, Mr. Gates, what would you do? What would you like for dessert? How would you like your dish? How would you like your caviar? The heart of so many people are burning. They're dying from jealousy. They hate their life. Why? Because someone made it. But if that someone will sleep on a mattress on the floor and will act like a regular person and drive a 1970 Chevy, like Warren Buffett, they show one of his houses, I don't know, maybe he has other houses, but it's a very old, very, very cheap house and he drives a very old car, and he stayed the same old man, like nothing is special about him, that is the greatest investor in the world. It makes a lot of people feel great. But when you see the rich and famous living in style, like they show all the time, people hate their life. It's all about jealousy. So if the rich suffer, like me, I'm good. If the rich enjoy an ice affair, I cannot stand my life. That's what's going on. If you had a Munah in Hashem, all those people who got so excited, it wouldn't bother them at all. Let him live, let him not live, let him enjoy, let him not. Who cares? What is it, my business? I have to focus on my relationship with Hashem. That brings us, Baruch Hashem, to the topic of tonight. We read in, on Shabbat Parashat Be'alotcha. In Israel, they already read Parashat Shlach, the story of the spies, which we, Be'ezrat Hashem, will have to, I guess, skip, because next week there's no lectures. Next week, no lectures at all. Not here and not in Brooklyn. So because of that, I don't know if I'll find the time to talk about the story of the spies. We'll see how we're going to do it. In the meantime... The parasha begins, Daber el Aaron ve Amarta el Av, speak to Aaron, Hashem said to Moshe, Be'alot cha et anerot. When you take care of the candles of the menorah, right? Yeah, this is what you have to do. Hashem gives him instruction how to handle the menorah. The Gemara asks, Rashi writes, Lama nismecha parashat menorah le parashat anesim? Every time there are two subjects in the Torah that are one next to each other, that means there's some kind of a connection between them. Rashi says, what, why the story of the menorah is right next to the sacrifices of the presidents, of the tribes? Because Aaron saw Hanukkah Tanisim, the grand opening of the Mishkan, every president of a tribe brings the sacrifice, and Aaron, which is greater than all of them, did not have the merit to do such thing and to participate in these in this sacrifices. He felt very bad. I don't even have the merit to start the Mishkan, the grand opening of the Mishkan. Not him and not his tribe. Hashem said to him, don't feel bad. Chayecha, calm down. Shelcha gdola mishelaem. Your merit is greater than, greater than them. Why? Because you are going to take care of the candles of the menorah. 
Also, there is a hint over here, right? It's not only the menorah of Bet Hamikdash; it's also it's also the menorah of Hanukkah. Why we have Hanukkah? Who were the Chashmonaim? Yehuda Makabi and Matityahu Kohen Gadol. All these people were Kohanim. So they had a schut to find the oil and to lead the menorah. So there is a hint over here that Hashem said to Aaron, not only are you going to take care of the candle of the Mishkan, in the future your children will revive the menorah by finding an oil and all can talk. We have to understand one thing. Why Aaron will feel bad because other people... Why Aaron feel bad because other presidents found they did a mitzvah? He should feel good for that. Baruch Hashem, other people had the schut. If somebody got aliyah in shul, you sit and you're jealous? You should be happy that another Jew got aliyah. Ma, why you should be jealous? There is a secret here. Hashem said to Aaron, you are greater than them. Why? Because it broke your heart that you cannot participate in a grand opening of the Mishkan. For me... A Jew with a broken heart because he cannot do a mitzvah is greater than anyone else. A broken heart that speaks to Hashem is much more effective than someone that does not have a broken heart. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. We know about Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is one of the ten people who actually went to heaven with their body. They sanctified their body so much. Chayim Hashem took them with their body to the Olam Maba. Very, very unique. As a list of ten people. He was the last one out of the ten. But that's not the topic right now. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma, page 69, the Gemara say, Anshe HaKneset HaGdola. There's 120 Chachamim and Prophets, and Sheikh Knesset Agdola, and they made us the davening that we daven today, the words of the Tfilot, right? Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Lama Nikram Shmam and Sheikh Knesset Agdola. Why do you call these 120 Chachamim and Sheikh Knesset Agdola, the people of the big Knesset? Shechaziru Atara Leyoshna. They brought the, the lost crown of the Jewish nation back to the Jewish nation. Meaning they revived the successful, glorious tradition that was lost. It's like someone had, a, someone had a father that was very rich. The father lost all his money. And the son was poor. And the grandson brought back the, the family back into wealth and glory. That's called revive what used to be good in that family, okay? So the Gemara say, Moshe came and say, Ael Agadol Agibor Vanora. Ael, it's the God. Agadol, the great God. Agibor, the hero. Anora, what's the right word for Nora? Meaning unbearable. Too big to, to mess with. Then Yirmiya, Prophet Jeremiah came when he saw the Babylonians destroying Bet Hamikdash, the first temple, going on fire. He said, "Strangers, occupy the house of God. How can we say Nora? Where is where is the unbearable God?" He dropped that word from the sentence. Meaning the Goim can do whatever they want and Hashem is silent. I do not say Nora anymore. Tov. If Hashem didn't punish them, how can I say Nora? Tov. They're not even afraid of Hashem. They do whatever they want. I can't say Nora. It's a lie. I'm sorry. Yirmiyahu didn't say Nora. Then came Prophet Daniel. Daniel. And he saw the problems and the suffering of exile. And he said, the children of God are slaves to this goyim. They torture them. Where is the hero here? If Hashem is a hero, he should have already buried them all. But Hashem is silent. 
Hay quien se hiro. No no va en no gibor. He didn't say gibor. Then came and she aknesset agdola and said, no, adraba, on the contrary. That's his greatness. What makes him so great that he's not impulsive? He doesn't react like an angry person that sees something and immediately reacts without thinking. By him, everything is calculated with a lot of patience. You have to be a superhero and super powerful to see people rebel against you, fight you, embarrass your religion, fight with such horrible ungratefulness against you, and not only not bury them, give them oxygen and money and cars and houses and marriage and whatever they have. In the end, you're going to give them what they deserve, of course. But what makes you great? That you have a lot of patience. You don't act with anger on a spot. That you wait for the right time to punish the people, that the punishment will be educational, not just revenge. So, because Hashem is so great, and he has patience, and he waits for the wicked people to do tshuva, that's what made him Nora. Otherwise, if you want to say that Hashem is not Gibor and Nora, explain please how one sheep is surrounded, surrounded by 70 wolves that wants to eat it alive, and the sheep is surviving, and all the wolves are dying one after the other by miracle. Meaning, where is Babylon? Gone. Where are the Persians? Gone. Where is the Romans? Gone. Where are the Greeks? Gone. Where are the Philistines? Gone. All these empires who came to us, they don't exist anymore. They vanished. And we, the little sheep, the little sheep that Hashem is protecting for thousands of years is still around, and not only around, is running the show in every country. Everybody knows it. The Goim are not denying it. It drives them crazy. It creates a lot of anti-Semitism, which is seriously on a rise right now. But everybody knows it's all for the Jews. Why? The father of the Jewish people is the creator of the world. What can you do about it? So, Anshe Knesset Agdola, they decided to make the tefillah. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Veeloke Avotenu, Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Ha'el HaGadol, HaGibor VeHanora. They brought back the crown who used to be in the time of Moshe. They, by saying those three names, HaGadol, the greater, HaGibor, the hero, VeHanora. They are bearable. The Rebbe Mibrisk, it says, when we praise Hashem in a tefillah, when we pray, what do we say? Ata gibor le'olam Hashem. You are a hero forever. Why do we have to say to Hashem, you are a hero forever? What's the word forever is for? You are a hero and that's it. Meaning always, what do we need to say? Le'olam, forever. Ata gibor le'olam Hashem. If Hashem is hero, would we ever suspect that he loses his strength? God forbid. That we have to say in the tefillah, you're not just a hero like someone that is 20, but when he's going to become 70, he's not going to be a hero anymore. Okay, we know that. People are people. But by Hashem, you need to specify you are a hero, not like us temporarily. You are a hero forever. It's obvious. Why would you even insult Hashem by saying le'olam? That's the question of Chaimi Brisk. He said, Ata gibor le'olam, Ata gibor Hashem, that's it. You don't need le'olam. What? Rav Chaim explained, it says, people are mistakenly ask, where is the greatness of Hashem? Where, where do you see that he's a hero? We have a whole course book. Exile, wars, problems, Arabs everywhere. Took over the Betam Dash, built over there in pure mask, inside Kodesh Kodashim, 
It says like this, we are praising Hashem that although you do everything you can to hide your greatness, we are not confused by that. Meaning when there are generations that you're not performing miracles or you're not taking revenge against the anti-Semite goyim, we may come to a mistake that God forbid maybe you went to sleep or you got tired of us or you have no desire to help us. No, no, no. We are declaring that for us when you destroyed Paro and his people, you were a hero. And when the Nazis were killing us in Auschwitz, you were still the hero. And we're not question you, we're not questioning you ever even when we don't see your, uh, what's heroines? What's the word for that? Heroism. Heroism. Even when we don't see your heroism, we are still declaring that we have no doubt whatsoever about your ability and about your power. It's written in a parasha four times, in a Torah, four times, menorah. The word menorah is written four times. Two times with Vav and two times with Dadevav, missing letter. In the holy language, sometimes you use Yud and Vav, sometimes you have t- times in the right spells without it. You may think, oh, it's not consistent. How come sometimes you spell Aaron with Vav and sometimes you spell Aaron without Vav? It's the same person. The answer is there are huge secrets in it. It's called Ktiv Male ve Ktiv Chaser. Full riding and missing riding. Four times what? Four times without Vav? Let's see. Rav Chaim Kanievsky said, in our parasha, in this parasha, the word menorah appears four times. Two times Khtiv Male and two times Khtiv Chaser. How come? Why? The answer is, the first menorah who made it ever in history, Moshe Rabbeinu, he was, in, he was existing in the first temple that King Solomon built. Meaning Moshe was 300 years before Shlomo. The menorah that Moshe made remained hundreds of years. Pure gold, one piece. The menorah has to be one piece of, of, of the entire menorah, one piece. Not pieces that you assemble together with schools. It has to be one big chunk of gold. And from that, you crave it in such a way that you're going to have this amount that you can go to see a sample of it by the Western world. They have it in that big box, big clear box. You can see exactly how it looked. So the first menorah Moshe did, Moshe made, and when they destroyed the temple, who took it? The Kasdim. Ur Kasdim, where is Ur Kasdim? Kurdish, Kurdistan, in Iraq. The Kasdim, they live where the Kurdish people live today. They took it to Iraq, to Babel, as it's written in the end of the book of Jeremiah. When they build the second temple, it's written in the book of Ezra that they took back all the pieces that were captured by the Babylonians. They brought it back from Babylon back to Jerusalem when they came to build the second temple. Who gave permission to bring back all the things? The king, Koresh. Who was Koresh? The king of Persia, who defeated Iraq. Persia, what we call Iran today, took over after Babylon. Babylon was the first empire. Persia was the second. They knocked out the Babylonians. They took control. And Koresh was a good king, good righteous guy. He gave us permission to come build the second temple and he also paid for it. 
sponsor it. It was smart, smart men. He said, let's rebuild the house of God. What's the problem? I'll sponsor it. No, very nice. Even today you have smart goyim. They want to sponsor lectures. They want to sponsor CDs. They want to sponsor guys in yeshiva, poor families. Why? Because they are very smart. The Torah say, if you see a goy that is smart, believe it. There's a lot of smart goyim. Chokhma ba goyim, ta'amin. What's the wisdom of this goyim? They do a very simple calculation. The world has a creator, yes. He created me, Tony the Goy, Vini the Goy, Sandra the Goya, yes. He told us in the Torah that we all believe in, even Christian, that he chose the Jewish people to be his children. And there's nothing he wants more to have a good relationship with his children, like every normal father. So if there are lost children, lost children, that they are not in connection with Hashem, and they don't know about the religion, they grew up like Goyim, they don't know about Shabbat, they don't know anything. And I, the Goy, or the Goya, can actually sponsor and help that some of the Jews will connect back to Hashem. What will Hashem think about me? Good or bad? The greatest. He's going to be a Goy 70 years. It will not be equal to one Jew that will become a little bit better in religion, thanks to his money. So that's the smartest goyim in the world. You can buy buildings, you can buy hedge funds, you can buy companies, you can make billions of dollars. It's nothing compared to turning one Jew into a son of Hashem, a loyal son. They know, but how many of them knows? 1% of 1% of 1% of who knows what? Not that many goyim understand that. And Jews, all would have known it. They learn Torah, no? But they're not acting on it. Even those who sit in yeshivot, rich people, they come to learn Dafyomi, they learn Gemara, they learn Musar, they learn Rambam. They read, or in the Zohar, they read that the most important thing in life is to make Baalei Tshuva, and they're not willing to give a dollar for it a year. Why? Big Yetzirah. The Satan is going to do everything to direct your money to different directions, but not to the best cause. That's why when you want to give money to other causes that are not so important, you feel very generous and very happy. When you want to do it for the most important cause, there's a big resistance and a big fight. So, what happened? The menorah was brought back by Ezra, all the Klea Mikdash, they brought back to build the second temple. This menorah was all the way until the time of the Greeks. Meaning from time of Moshe until the Greeks, it was about 900 years. When the Greeks came and they impured the Beta Mikdash and the oils and the menorah, the Gemara in Masechet Avozah, page 52, the Gemara said, we could not use that menorah anymore after the impurities fired it. So what happened? Beta Hashmonaim. Matityahu Hashmonaim and his five sons and the few hundred Jews who helped them. If you remember the story of Hanukkah, they made a new menorah. A new menorah. Gemara in Masechet Menachot, page 28, the Gemara says, Malchi Hashmonaim. They made a very simple menorah from a piece of metal, not gold. Very, very cheap. Very, very thin metal. You give it one piece, you break it. Nothing fancy. Why? They were poor. The Greeks were in control. There was nothing to eat. That's, that's kosher. If you don't have a gold menorah, it's kosher. Kasher bediyeved. If you don't have, you make it from from piece of metal or aluminium. Once they became wealthy, after they kicked the Greeks away from Israel, they turn it into silver. They made it. They cover it with silver. Then they become wealthier. They made it from a gold. This menorah remained until the end of the second temple. 
Once the second temple ended, that menorah was there the entire time. So how many menorahs all together we had? First one, original pure gold that Moshe Rabbeinu made. Second one, the Hashmonaim made from metal. Third one, they made from silver. And fourth one, they made from gold. So how many? Four. Two of them, kosher lechatchila, pure gold, the first one and the last one. And the two middle one, which was metal and silver, which is not as good, is downgrade. Only kasher bedieved. It's kosher when you really don't have a choice. If you had gold and you do it from silver, it's not good. If you had gold and you do it from metal, it's an insult. If you don't have gold, now you have no choice. You can do it from silver. You don't have silver, you do it from metal. But that's not perfect. Because two menorot were not perfect, the word menorah is missing a letter two times. You see the secret of the Torah? Every little thing has a secret in it. Nothing is random. That's why the word menorah is written four times. Two times with Vav, two times without the Vav, menorah. Why? Because the other two times were not superb, was not perfect. Not perfect, missing a letter. See? That's a beautiful secret why it's written in a specific way. Then, Pasuk It should have said When you come to the war, you don't say when you come war. It's not proper speaking. It's written It Should have said It's missing lamed. Lamilchama means to the war. Why there is a missing letter over here? The Ben Ishchai, the holy Ben Ishchai, is talking about the verse, Akol kol Yaakov ayadayim yedei esav. The voice is the voice of Jacob, and the hands are the hands of Esav. Esav is the founder, founder of Edom. Edom is the founder of Amalek. And... Haman, Haman Agagi, Agag, the king of Amalek, and the Nazis, all came from Esav. Yaakov is the founder of the Jewish nation. His name was changed to Israel. So, what is the meaning of the verse, the voice is the voice of Jacob, and the hands are the hands of Esav? Meaning the Jews, they're not meant to be successful with their hands, meaning killing, fighting, war. That's not their purpose. The nation of Israel has one very important weapon, is their mouth, meaning the Torah. Holy mouth, Torah, Psalms, prophets. When a person speaks words of God from his mouth, is greater than any weapon. Today, unfortunately, is because close to 80% of the Jewish people in the world are not religious. And the majority of these 80% have no idea what religion is. And they grew up 100% like non-Jews. Some of them were not even circumcised. Some of them don't even have mezuzot in their house. Some of them eat only not kosher food all their life. They have no idea what Shabbat is. Because the situation is below terrible, really one of the worst times ever. As a result of that, many of the Jewish people do not even believe in God. And they don't believe in the Torah. And don't believe in the power of saying words of Torah or praying. They laugh at you. 
If you tell them, let's pray before we go to the war, they'll laugh at you. Say, enough with your nonsense. I'm an atheist. Because they grew up like Goim, they behave like Goim. Goim understand power. We go to the war, we have to have the best planes, the best tanks, the best marines, the best seals, all kinds of fighters. We have to train them day and night and abuse them and torture them that when they come to the war, they'll be monsters. So the Israelis, when they funded their army, copied from the British, the Americans, the Turks, the Ottomanim, all the armies that they had in the war. They just made it better than some countries. Not all, but some. So when you go and you join the Israeli army, they humiliate you, they abuse you, they torture you, mentally and physically. Why? They want to make you understand that you are nothing. We're giving you the orders and you will follow. If you don't follow, put you in jail. We mess up your life. We throw you out of the army with a profile 21. 21, that means you're crazy. Nobody wants to hire you. Even a driver's license you're not going to be able to get. Once we put that in your release notebook, that you will release on uh, Iatama, that you do not match the system, it's, today it's not so important like it used to be. But back then it was mamash like a stain for life. So they, they humiliate you from day one. They shave your head, they give you uniform, they give you a blanket. It will take you a whole day with your friend to shake the blanket and still dust coming out. You cannot believe the amount of dust it is. You keep going, boom, a cloud of dust. Boom, cloud of dust. Hundred times, still that's coming out. And if you're lucky, there's no lice in it. Sometimes there's lice in it and they go under your skin. All of a sudden, you look at your skin and you see black dots. You run to the doctor in the base. They have a name for it. I forgot the name of this disease. Lice go under the skin. Ah, oh, what a disaster. Bathroom, no bathroom. What do you think you're going to see it? There's all in the ground. All kinds of things like this. Why? We're going to make you a monster. That you'll be able to live in a desert, you'll be able to live in the mountains, you'll be, live to, you'll be able to live in a forest, you know how to shoot, you'll be able to suffer. Why? Because we are Goim, we behave like Goim, and that's what the Goim, that's how the Goim designed their army. If they knew Torah, they knew that the best times we have an army was in Moshe Rabbeinu, Yoshua ben Nun, King David, King Solomon. Nobody tortured the soldiers. The soldiers were all religious people. And the win, the victories did not come because they were good soldiers. Only because they were learning Torah before they go to the war. And they leave some of the soldiers to learn. And the other ones go and Hashem perform miracles. As it's written a verse in the Torah, Hashem ilachem lachem. God will fight for you and you just be quiet, meaning sit and enjoy the show. When you don't have a faith, when you don't have a munah, you don't believe in God, and you don't believe in the power of prayers, you are not a species in nature, just like animals go to a war. They don't pray in retailing before. So what happened? You want to do it your way? Do it your way! You have a Mossad, and you have spies, and you have the best Air Force, everything. Where did it lead you? Here, seven years later. Where are you? The Arabs with drugs win you. Half of Israel were gone already. With all your army. Jews are safe in the world? No. Jews are safe in Israel? No. What's the, what's the story? Israel is full of Arabs everywhere, every city. They take over. The police is shaking from them. The soldiers are shaking from them. They beat up soldiers in the street. They don't even respond. They have a gun and a woman giving them smacks and filming. And they sit like, stand like this and they're afraid to reply. Why? Because the lefty liberals will put them in jail if you beat up the Arab back. So what good is that army? Hashem show you that the army is worthless. Police, worthless. Government, worthless. Relationship with America went down the drain. No matter what you try to do, you failed. Look at America. Such a wealthy army with a huge budget. 
They have more tanks than anyone, more planes than anyone, uh, submarines, nuclear bomb. After Russia, they are the second with nuclear b b uh, missiles. The United States is the wealthier army in the world with so many abilities that other armies do not have. Please name to me one war that the United States won. There is none. They lost in all the battles. They lost in Afghanistan. They lost everywhere, in Iraq. They just came, made a mess, and they achieved nothing. It happened in any war or any activity of army they did in the rest of the world. Nothing. Even Bin Laden, which they trained to go against the Russian, turned against them and killed 3,000 Americans in September 11. Meaning, thinking that your strength and your talent will succeed to you, for you, that's the, where the mistake is. And Hashem cannot stand it. I want to tell you something. One Israeli pilot came to Long Island here. There's a place where they teach pilots about battles, combat. The, the American pilot who gave the course was talking about World War I, World War II, all kinds of famous battles between Air Force to Air Force. The entire week, he mentioned every war you can think of. He did not say one word about the Six Days War. That was the biggest success of any Air Force in the history of the world. In six days, the Israeli Air Force knocked out all the Arab countries. They did not leave them anything. So the Israeli asked him, excuse me, we've been speaking for a week already. And you didn't even say a word about the Six Day War which was the greatest victory of any Air Force in history. The American uh, pilot looked at him and said, over here, my job is to teach you how to be successful in combat, not to rely on miracles that had of the Jews do to do for them, does for them. You want me to fix the world that your God did such a miracle to you against the lads? How exactly is going to help the rest of the pilots here from different air force? That will also do the same thing for them? The Goy. The Goy understood something like this can never be achieved because you are, you are talented. It's because Hashem decided this time I'm going to fight for you. When no one said thank you, a few years later came the Yom Kippur War, 1973. Six years later. And what happened? Thousands of thousands died. Israel was mamash hours bef before they got destroyed. Hours. That's when Hashem started the miracles again. So Ben Shai said, when the voice of Yaakov is strong, meaning there's a lot of Torah and prayers, the hands of Esav become weak. They want to hurt us, but they can't. When the voice of Yaakov is going lower and there's no Torah and no prayers, the hands of the staff becoming more powerful. The Ben Ishchai say just like an axe. When you chop a tree, you hold the axe with the handle. Who really moved the axe to chop the trees? The handle. Who moves the handle? The person. The, the ox doesn't have any meaning without the hand and the energy of the human being. A self can damage the Jewish nation only when he has that handle and the hand that moves it. Who is the hand that moves it? Is the hand of a self. When is the hand getting the power? When the voice of Yaakov is going weak, those hands become with lots of energy. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 61, the Gemara says, One time the wicked kingdom made a decree that the Jews cannot learn Torah. Papus, Papus, son of Judah, found Rabbi Akiva teaching Torah in public. Learning Torah and teaching Torah. The Romans say, if we'll catch one Jew that teach Torah, we'll kill him in a brutal death. And Rabbi Akiva was risking his life to gather people on the street and teach them Torah, give speeches. Not in the air-conditioned uh, shul with three nice chandeliers. On the street. 
when the Romans can catch him any minute. And I don't have to tell you what would be his end, just exactly as it was. So, Rabbi Akiva, Papus came to him and said, you're not afraid of the Roman kingdom? You know if they catch you, what they're going to do to you? Rabbi Akiva said to him, you know, there was a fox walking by the lake, and he saw the fish. The fish are trying to run away from the net, from the trap of the fishermen. The fox saw that they're running left and right, maneuvering like that. He asked them, what are you afraid of? He said, we're afraid from the fishermen who are hunting us. The fox said, why do you continue to live like that with fear? Maybe you should come up to the land and you and me would live together in a nice neighborhood, in brotherhood. The fish told him, you are the fox that people say that you're smart. You're nothing but dumb. When we are in a water that we can swim and maneuver and, and run away from the net, we are worried if we come out of the water, we'll die for sure. That's what Rabbi Akiva said to Papus. When we are learning Torah, we're still afraid that we're going to get caught and get killed. If we stop learning Torah, for sure we'll get killed. Because if anything saves us, is the Torah. Are you suggesting that I'm going to stop learning and teaching Torah? Then for sure we'll be dead, all of us. If anything saves us, is the Torah. Few days later, they caught Rabbi Akiva and put him in jail. And they also caught the same day Papus. The same Papus who was preaching to Rabbi Akiva. Papus, Rabbi Akiva said to Papus, what brought you over here? Papus said to him, how lucky you are, Rabbi Akiva, that you were captured for teaching Torah. Oy lo le Papus shenit pas al dvarim betelim. Oy to Papus that he was caught for nonsense. Uh, me and you, we both here in jail. At least you are here because you taught Torah. I'm here for nothing. What does it mean? I don't understand. Do you know who was this Papus? You're not going to believe it. This Papus was one of the holiest people in the history of the world. He sacrificed his life to save the Jewish nation from death. He died in Lud. Arugay Lud. Who are Arugay Lud? The Gemara said, in heaven they have a section only for them. Now nobody else can go there. The highest level. There is one higher level than that. Do you know which one? People who make Baalei Tshuva. People that sponsor to make Baalei Tshuva. People that do Zikuy Arabim have a special section for themselves. But other than that, from all the religious people, someone who sacrificed his life on Kiddush Hashem to sanctify Hashem is going to a very high level in Olam Abba. The Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit say, En shkol b'riya yichola la'amod b'mchitzatam. There is no one can stand next to them. What was the greatness of Arugay Lut? The daughter of the Roman, of the Roman governor, she was found dead. Who would dare to kill her? Wow. The Goim say the Jews killed her. They're not happy from the Roman kingdom. The Goim killed her as a revenge, which was a lie. The Jews never killed her. Papus and Lulianus came and say, we killed her. Because they, were, they knew if they're not going to say it, they're going to kill all Jews. They say, we killed her, but they didn't. Don't mess with the other Jews. They have nothing to do with that. Me and him, we killed her. So they killed them in a horrible torture, and they were not guilty. But they sacrificed their life to save the life of the rest of the Jewish nation. I want to ask you a question. Rabbi Akiva was captured and later killed because he was teaching Torah. This Papus was captured and getting killed because he said that he killed the daughter of the governor. And as a result of that, he sacrificed his life, even though he was not guilty, to save the life of others. He's going to the highest level. 
So why does he say to Rabbi Akiva, how lucky you are that you are here because you were teaching Torah and how miserable I am that I'm here for nonsense? You, can you answer me this question? Does it make sense? Rav Shimshon Pinkus, Alava Shalom, Zatzal, he said, as great as it is to save the life of people, someone is about to die and you're a good doctor, you went, you gave him, I don't know, electric, you, did a, you operate on him, you saved his life, wow. You saw someone drowning in the lake, you jumped with your suit, you grabbed him, you gave him some oxygen, some air, and you, and you brought him back to life. Wow. Everybody talks about you. You saved the life. You save a lot of other people from death. All kinds of things like this. There's no question that the mitzvah is huge. No question. But compared to teaching Torah, it's nothing. Sheneemar, as it's written clearly, Gadol Talmud Torah Yoter Me'atzalat Nefashot Learning and teaching Torah is greater than saving lives of people. Physical life. Physical life. So Papo said, I'm going to get killed because I saved the life of many Jews from death. But I'm nothing compared to you. You are getting killed because you did not give up and you continue to teach Torah every day. I'm so jealous with you. I wish I would get killed for teaching Torah, not for saving bodies. From this Gemara you learn, if you're smart, the importance of learning and teaching Torah. And nothing in the world, in the universe, comes near it. When you share the divine wisdom with people, you actually praise God, you spread his knowledge everywhere, you make people better, you improve them spiritually, and in the end they inherit a share to the world to come, which is the purpose of this entire creation, that people over here will earn their share to the world to come. In the Gemara Masechet Avot, Avot the Rabbi Natan, there is a story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rashbi, the writer of the Zohar. He lived 2,000 years ago. He went to the hospital to visit a guy that had sickness in his stomach. And he was screaming from pain. He had problem in his stomach. Because of his suffering, he started to curse Hashem. Like this, in public, in front of Rashbi the greatest rabbi in the world, in the, in the universe. <laughs> Rashbi told him, Reka, you fool! Why you speak like this to Hashem? Instead of using your mouth for such bad words, why don't you pray? Do something positive with your mouth. Maybe Hashem will have mercy on you and save you. This sick person was an ungrateful human being. Now you understand why he suffers so much. He answered, I wish you to have what I have. That's what he said to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You should have what I have. Rashbi went out from the hospital and Rashi said, thank you Hashem, I deserved it. Why? Because I left the most precious thing, which is learning Torah, and wasted my time on such foolish things, Dvarim Betelim, coming to visit the sick in the hospital. Now I know what you're thinking. What do you mean? If you go, if someone's sick in the hospital, you come, you, cheer, you, you pray for him, you cheer him up, you talk to him, you get him out of his depression. It's a huge mitzvah. No question about it. Huge mitzvah. But dust, Dust compared to one minute of learning Torah. Dust comparing a diamond to sand. Any mitzvah you bring, as important as it is, it doesn't come even near the importance of learning Torah. And the reward is accordingly. 
Same way, bitul Torah, limut Torah keneged kulam, the reward for learning Torah is the greatest, more than all other commandments. Not learning Torah is the biggest punishment, because just the fact that you don't earn trillions of mitzvot as you should every month, because you don't learn, you have to be punished for all this time you wasted when you have diamonds to collect and you're wasting your time on nonsense. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, thank you Hashem for punishing me. Instead of sitting and learning, I closed the Gemara and I went to visit the sick. From all the good sick people, who did you give me this low life wicked Rasha to curse me like this and wish me to get sick like him? Why Hashem did it to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? To teach him a lesson. It's very nice that you care to go visit the sick. But why you replace a diamond with a little coin of silver? You have a 10 carat diamond already in your hand. You drop it and you replace it with a coin of silver. Someone who doesn't have the diamond grab the coin of silver. He's not sitting and learning Torah. Run, visit the sick all day. Very good. Give, poor food, give the poor people food. Tom Chesh Abbas for Shabbat. You're not learning. You might as well do something else. Read Tehillim all day. You're not learning Torah. No, read Tehillim. But someone that learns Torah does not waste his time on anything else. Besides the mitzvot that comes in a specific time that you have to do. You pray, Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit. If you don't do it, the time will pass. That's it. But if, if it's a mitzvah for the public and someone else can do it, you don't do it. You sit and learn Torah. That's what's, that's what's written over here. Vechi tavou milchama. Tavou means taviu. When you go to the war, you should know you brought the war on yourself. There's no coincidence. The goyim don't attack you out of nowhere. The Arabs don't want to slaughter all of you out of nowhere. The Nazis didn't come to destroy you out of nowhere. The Romans and the Greeks and all the other wicked people... They did not come to you out of nowhere. They came to you because you attracted them to you. Why? Because you don't learn Torah and your voice is not heard and the hands of the anti-Semites goyim are on the rise. When the goyim feel confident, they have the power, immediately they look for someone to torture. And who that someone? That's the story of the world. Every tragedy you saw, you ask who all it is, the answer of all of us. Why? Because we don't learn enough Torah. In a night like tonight, you should have had hundreds of people fighting to enter the place here. Where are they? Watching Seinfeld. Whatever garbage they watch, I don't know. They still have Seinfeld on TV? Still have it? Still alive, Bichlal? No. Do you understand what's going on here? Watching baseball, watching football, watching, I don't know what, comedy, watching dirty movies. So when they don't come to learn Torah, the hands of Iran become stronger. The hand of all other enemies, Hezbollah and Hamas, becoming stronger. And that's why every day Jews are dying by attacks. Every day. Every day. Minimum at least one victim. Minimum. Every day. Attacks everywhere. Why? If all Jews would sit and learn Torah and make the Torah the center of their life, why would Hashem send the monsters to kill us when He sits and He enjoys every minute from our Torah? But when he see we all became clowns and some of us wicked clowns and ungrateful clowns and atheists and all kinds of other garbage, the Satan is having a claim and Hashem has nothing to answer. Because the court of heaven is a court of justice. So, Esav does not have his own power to hurt us at all. His power is determined based on us. When we are up, he's down. When we are down, he's up. Same with Ishmael. It's a seesaw. When the Zohar say, 
When Israel is up, Ishmael is down. When Israel goes down, Ishmael goes up. Automatically. It cannot be both of us up. Either we are up and they are down or the other way around. That's why the word milchama has in it the word lechem. Why you call bread lechem? Lechem because it comes from the word milchama. To bring food to the table, it's a struggle, it's a battle, it's a war. But it also has the word melach. Melach and lechem. That, that's why you take the bread and you dip it three times in a, in a salt. Lechem, me, melach, you put it together, why is it? The word milchama has lechem and has melach. The same letters in different order. What's the difference between lechem and melach? The Torah is called lechem. Lechu lachamu belachmi. It's an analogy, metaphoric. The Torah is compared to bread, lechem. You, same way you need lechem to survive, otherwise you die. You need Torah to survive, otherwise your soul is dead. The salt, you only need very little from it. Too much will kill you. You cannot have too much salt. If you compare the Torah to bread, meaning I need it all the time to survive, without it I have no life, right? Then we have a blessing. But if we use the Torah like salt, a little bit here and there, five minutes here, two minutes there, a little video clip, but no real serious learning, then we, use, we take the Torah like salt, very little. What comes? Only war and problem and who knows what else. Now we have to understand the nation of Israel is beginning to complain to Hashem that they want, want to go back to Egypt. We just read it on Shabbat. Who would ever believe such thing? They just came out of Auschwitz. They killed their children. They tortured them. They took away their homes and wealth. Torturing them in camps. Beating them up from morning to night. Nothing to eat. They scream, Vatal Shavatam El Hashamayim. They scream with such pain. Now Hashem took them out of Egypt, destroyed the Egyptian Empire, opened the Red Sea, and gave them manna every day, right? Falling down, you pick it up, you put it in your mouth. Anything you can imagine, that's what you taste. You want to taste steak? Steak. Sushi? Sushi. Whatever you like. Now they come to Hashem, so we're not happy. We're not happy. We missed Egypt. We missed Auschwitz. Something here is, uh, doesn't make any sense here. We have to understand. Remember, Torah, you don't learn like you read the newspaper. You have to understand what's going on here. When you read something in the Torah and it doesn't make sense to you, the problem is you. You don't know all the details. Always the problem is by you. The Torah always have logic. Always. You're not going to find something in the Torah with no logic. Now you're going to find the big secret here. They come to Hashem. Zacharnu et adaga asher nochal b'mitzrayim chinam. We miss the fish that we ate in Egypt for free. Fish? A pound of fish is $35 today. Fish for free? Who give prisoner fish? Even here in America, you don't... Uh, even the Arab terrorists who get anything you can think of, I doubt that they give them fish. Fish? It's expensive, more than meat. We remember the zucchini and the melons. Now it's dry. All we see all day is man, 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 mana. We don't understand. Chazal are telling us that whatever we need, man is like popcorn. You pick it up, you put it in your mouth, it melts immediately. You don't have to bite. You don't need to eat for that. The best part is you don't need to go to the bathroom. It dissolves inside the organs of the body. There's no waste. How can life be better than this? Four years you eat, eat, eat. You imagine any flavor you want, and that's what you taste, and you never have to go to the bathroom. No problem, no gas, no pressure in the stomach, no ulcer, nothing. Like this. Don't have to worry about anything. What? They should have made a party. I don't understand. What are they complaining about? They missed the Auschwitz? 
So if they can imagine any taste and they get any flavor they want, why they complain about the man? Doesn't make sense. It cannot be that dumb. You got such an upgrade and you complain? Rashi writes, Chinam min mitzvot Not for free, for free. Chinam in mitzvot We didn't have to be worried about keeping those mitzvot. What does it mean? Listen carefully, you're going to find a big secret now. They were willing to suffer in Auschwitz, in Egypt, any suffering you can imagine, beating them up, giving them terrible food, who knows, some leftover fish, some, who knows what they gave them. Garbage, obviously garbage. They rather get that than to take that divine manna. Amotzi lechem in shamaim. Bread from heaven. Why? Because the bread was a light detector. There was a lie detector attached to you all the time. If you are righteous, the manna fall right by the entrance to your tent. Ready to eat. You put it in your mouth and it's ready. If you are very wicked, it goes far away. Every morning you have to go far and collect it and bring it home and grind it and prepare it. It's a whole process. So there are three kinds of people, righteous, mediocre, and wicked. And each one of them get his manna in a different way. Let's read. Based on that, everybody knows who is righteous for real and who is not. You cannot fake anyone. Chazal says, In the middle of the night, first comes the dew, the morning dew that it doesn't get dirt, dirty from the sand, so everything become wet, and on top of it, the man falls. And also it's written, How come? Righteous people, it falls right by the entrance to their home. Mediocre, they had to go and collect. Wicked people have to go and collect and also have to grind. Meaning, if you're 50% righteous, 50% wicked, you don't have to grind, but you still have to go far to collect. So the man was not equal to everyone. It was depend if you're tzaddik or rasha. Now let's describe a scenario that was described by the, one of the greatest speakers of the previous generation, maybe the biggest one, Rav Shalom Mordechai HaKohen Shvadron. I heard few of his recording. It freezes your blood. You can see the holiness and the words that come from his holy mouth. Not like today, what kind of speakers you have today. When you hear him was talking, first of all you hear his voice, you feel like your blood is freezing. And the Musar that he was giving was very effective. Why? It's different when you have a speaker that gives Musar and half of what he says he doesn't keep. It doesn't have the effect to change the life of people. But when you have someone that speaks very strong Musar and ethics and he keeps everything he speaks, <laughs> a whole different league. Why? Because it affects very much the people. Listen to this, Rabotai. His, his, his ideas were beyond words. There was a Jew named Itzik Hatzadik. He made up an analogy. Parable. Every day, 3.30 a.m., gets up, run to shul, learn Chok Israel before the davening, say korbanot, daven, put filin, talit, after that, retailing, finish the shul, comes home, wash his hands, make a motzi lechem in a shamayim for the man that he just, you know, have. And eat the man, his wife serve it on a plate for him. One day he comes from davening, he puts his tefillin in a room, he comes to wash his hands, wash his hands, sit on the table, and his wife comes back with an empty plate. It's like, I'm sorry. What? The man is not here today. 
I went out to check by the entrance to our house, and there's no mana today. He was about to do a mozi. No man, what is he going to do now? And man, there's no man. He didn't arrive today. You sure? You checked? Of course I checked. Itzik dry his hands and say to his wife, okay, we have to sit and do cheshbon nefesh to think what sin we committed that the man did not come today. His wife say, I already did. Did you do? I didn't find anything wrong with what I did yesterday. So between yesterday and today, I definitely didn't do anything wrong. I don't know why. Maybe you did something wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I spoke a few words of Lashon Ara with someone. Yeah, yeah. Three minutes. It was only three minutes. I said a few words of Lashon Ara. Three minutes Lashon Ara? Every minute is 200 words. It's 600 words of Lashon Ara. 600 sins. Itzik, you, Itzik, the tzaddik, speak Lashon Ara. His wife was wondering. He say, at that time, it wasn't clear to me that what I speak is really a sin. I actually thought it's mitzvah to say it. But now I see that I'm, I was wrong. And it was Lashon Ara. That's why we are being punished now. The man is far. We have to go and collect it. His wife said to him, since you're the one who brought this problem on us, you should go and collect the man. Tov. Bring me a basket. He takes a basket and he begins to walk. And a person comes to him, Hi, Kvod Arav. Good morning, Kvod Arav. I have a very sick neighbor. Maybe you give him a bracha. I have his name. Wait well, one second. Take a note. Kvod Arav, his name is Ploni Ben Ploni. Where is the Rav going with this basket? You going shopping today? <laughs> He said, no, I have to go somewhere. No, the Rav, Rabbi, you don't have to go anywhere. You just stay and tell me where you have to go and I'll go for you. Whatever you need to bring. No, no, it's okay. No, no, Rabbi, please, I'm embarrassed. Let me do it. Let me do the mitzvah for you. Don't waste your time. I'm going to get my man. Your man? I wasn't by your, by your tent? Yeah, today didn't come to the tent. Oh, so forget about the bracha. You don't need to give bracha to my neighbor. It's okay. I'll manage. I'll find someone that really can give a bracha. It's the biggest shame. One day, the man doesn't fall next to your place. It's a huge shame. Everyone know you did a sin. You committed a sin. He's thinking, that's a tzaddik. I'm asking him for bracha, and he walks with me to collect the man. Itzik is going and get abused. People are talking behind him. What, look, what, look at the rabbi. He has to go collect his man like us. When he finds his man, he found out that he's not even mediocre. He needs a grinder. He wasn't even grounded. He comes now back to where, you know, where all the criminals are gathering to look for their piece of man. And everybody saw him. Itzik Atzadik, you came today to pay us a visit. You're so humble. You went down to the nation. You want to hear about what movie we watch or something? Maybe we play poker or something. What, what are you doing here? First time is there. I came to collect my man. Quickly gets the man. He runs away because everyone ma you know, make fun. He lost his reputation. Now no one will come to him for blessing. No one will come to learn by him. So, big problem. He comes home. He says, anyway, I lost my appetite. But, you know, we have to eat. We have to make a mozi. So, no. She brings the man to the, to the table. He makes netila. He comes to bite. He broke his teeth. Can't eat it. It's hard like a rock. You have to grind it. What happened to eat? You okay? Go ask the neighbor, maybe they have a grinder. He, she comes to the neighbor, do you have maybe a grinder? No, we don't have. Baruch Hashem, we never needed a grinder. We had tzadikim. Of course, she's not going to admit. If she has a grinder, that means she's wicked. <laughs> Nobody would admit. <laughs> so, you know, it's like those who have COVID, they're afraid to say it at work. 
because they know they're going to get fired or something like this. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, I got last night. I was late. You know, it was windy. <laughs> you sure you don't have... <laughs> so the same thing over here. You sure you don't have a grinder? No one has a grinder in town. Why? Everyone pretend he's a tzaddik. If you think the problem of Itzik was over, where will he find a, a, a bowl now to cook the man? Right? It's a big problem. Who knows what they cooked in it? Big problem. So the Jewish nation sent to Hashem, listen, we don't want your man and we don't want all these tricks. Give us the garbage we were eating in Egypt. I don't know, fish, leftover, whatever the Egyptian threw on the floor. Better this than a bread that tells who we are. We don't want that chain. Problem is, but you know, I'm a bike and I hide. Everybody knows what everyone knows. You're not going to be able to come with your nice frock like a big rabbit. Oh, I. No one keeps my hand over here. What happened? Nobody gives them quitel. What happened? Ah, over there, we know who you are. Your foolish followers, they, you know, spend a lot of money on you. Question is, what? Do you think you can fool us over here? Moshe comes and says to Hashem, I cannot take this anymore. I did not take this job to be their babysitter. I can't. Moshe said, You're telling me to hold them like your mother holds the baby in her, in her arms. Like, uh, like, like nursing a baby. I took this job to help them and to save them and to teach them to run. Not what, dealing with meals and water and this. I'm not a babysitter. If that's the way to, to be killed me now, I don't want this job. Kill me. That's, by the way, the first time that Moshe actually complained to Hashem about his own situation. Even though he was the most humble person ever, he saw that they come and they attack him. Moshe said, listen, in this world you have rich people that their job is to make sure that all poor people will have what to eat. And then you have the rabbis, who their job is to make sure that every Jew would learn Torah and know Torah. I, Moshe Rabbeinu, is the rabbi. I'm not the rich man that's supposed to feed the people and take care of their food. But they ask me to take care of them, to ask them. That's the job, or to teach them Torah is the job. Listen, this story is going like a very much. If you want to say, I told you that he was about 150 years ago in Europe. He was able to write with two and two languages at the same time. How many people like this you know in the world? He was giving a shiur to 15 students in 15 subjects simultaneously. Going from one to another, talking to him about this subject, going to the next one, different subject. And at the same time, people were coming in and asking questions. How to believe such things? At that time, there was a war, the Second World War. The German occupied half of Poland. And the other half was in the control of the Russians. So Poland, half by the German, half by the Russians. Lithuania was still free. All the Shiva boys went to Lithuania. Lita. You know, families, the families stay either by the Russian side half or by the German half. So that was the situation right now. One time, Rav Yaakov Galinsky was a, a child, I mean a teenager back then. And his rabbi came to him, the rabbi of Klinik, Rav Chizkiyahu Mish, Mish, uh, Mishkovsky. He said to him, do you want me to bring you into the room of Rav Chaim Oizer? I was like, almost like meeting in the eyes of the people. You're going to get me to go into Rav Chaim Oizer's room? <laughs> I'll kill for it. No, so what? To understand, right, just that you understand, a few years ago, one of Gdolei Ador, Rav Michael Yudha Lefkovich, 
that learn in Vilna, spoke about the years that he learned in Yeshivat Hevron by Rav Yecheskel Sarna. One time he said, you know, when I had to get accepted, I didn't need to be tested. I had a, rev, a letter from my rabbi in Vilna, Rav Shlomo Heinemann, and Rav Chaim Oizer had the two lines in the end. Rav Chaim Oizer wrote that he confirmed everything in the letter. I mean, he knows Rav Levkovich. Rav Levkovich. He said, you know Rav Chaim Oizer? He said, yes. And he was the one who testified that he went into the room and he was giving 15 students, 15 different lessons, while he's answering people who were asking questions in Acha. In your eyes I saw. I'm not telling you what people say. That's what I saw. Rav Galinsky said, they said that he writes with two hands, two languages at the same time. This I didn't see, he said. I only can tell you what I saw in my own eyes, that he gave 15 shiurim to 15 people simultaneously. This was Rav Chaim Oizer. Rav Yaakov Galinsky was learning Masechet Yevamot at that time. He knows he's going to meet the most important rabbi of Europe 150 years ago. That means take the biggest rabbi in the world today, multiply it by 10. Back then. So he has to learn all night Masechet Yevamot, that in case Rav Chaim will ask him a question on a Gemara, he won't look like a fool. So he said, all night I did not sleep. I kept repeating the Gemara, repeating, 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 in case he will ask me. So in the morning they came there, there were 30 people waiting. The door was open and Rav Mishkovsky told him, Kanes, get in. They got into the room. Rav, Yankale, Rav Yaakov Galinsky, which was the, one of the biggest speakers of until 20 years ago in the world. Unbelievable speaker he was. So he was sure that the first question he will ask him, what Gemara you learned, tell me some Dvar Torah, which usually that's the case. Maybe you have some Chidushim of your own. Rav Chaim looked at him and said, Shalom Aleichem. When did you get a letter from your parents recently? He asked him. That was the first question. Rav Yaakov said, a few months I have not got any letter. Why? Because they are in the occupied uh, territory. There's no way to send mail. First, second question, do you have a blanket? It's very cold there. Do you have a blanket? He didn't ask him if you have a bed, because no one had a bed. Everyone slept on the floor, but at least a blanket. So he said, yes, I have a blanket. Third question, can I look at your shoes? Move. He was standing, the, the table was blocking. Can you move to the side? I want to look at your shoes. Rav Yaakov Galinsky had, his shoes was totally ripped. It was a big embarrassment to show such shoes. Well, what can he do? The Rebbe asked. So he moved to the side. He lifted his pants. And Rav Chaim Oizer looked at his shoes opened the drawer, took money, gave it to him and said, go and buy yourself good shoes. In the end of the story, Rav Yaakov Galinsky said, the biggest rabbi of Europe did not care about the Gemara and how much I know and what Chidushim I have to say. He cared about me. Do you have a blanket? Your parents are knowing where you are. You got any letter from your parents? Do you have shoes? The, what I can do for you? I'm a babysitter of the community. There's no contradiction being the biggest rabbi, teaching Torah, writing books, being a dayan in a bed din, and at the same time taking care of all the miserable people. There was Gdol Ador. Rav Chaim Ibrisk, a different Gdol Ador, his house was always a house for poor people. Like Ben Tamchui. Like, uh, what the, what's the name of Ben Tamchui? Where the poor people come to eat for free. Homeless shelter. Huh? Homeless shelter. Not homeless shelter, place that people come to eat for free. Louder. Soup kitchen. Soup kitchen. Top. One time, 
the Gabaim, the collectors, those who collect the money, came to the Rebitzin and said, Yesterday we left enough pieces of chopped wood in your garage, meaning storage, to heat up your house. Where is it all gone in one day? We don't find the wood there. She said, very nice, thank you very much for putting all this chopped wood. But when the rabbi saw that we have a full storage of wood, he called the poor people and gave it all to them. To each one of them, he gave a few pieces that I can warm the house. The Gabaim said, Okay, a few hours later, they brought new wood. And they say, Here is the key. We put a lock on the storage. This wood is for you and your husband, the rabbi, not for the poor people. We're giving it to you with condition that you're not allowed to give it to anyone else but yourself. The next day, they came again to the rabbi, and they saw the house is still freezing, freezing. They're shaking from the cold weather. They asked the rabbi, and what happened? Did you give the wood again to the poor people? She said, no, you told us we're not allowed. So how can we do it? So why are you not warming the house? She said, my husband said, if the poor people are shaking tonight, we will also shake. We're not going to sit in a warm room when everybody else is shaking. So what happened? I will also freeze with him. That's a leader. You understand what it means? Ah, just to be Gadol Batora. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva Iger, the Chazonish, Chazonish, was very impressed by Rabbi Akiva Iger. He said no one can understand how bright he was. He's so deep. Nobody can understand how deep he was. But he was so humble. No matter how giant of a chacham he was, he was so humble. One time Rabbi Akiva Iger and Rabbi Yaakov Melissa came to the synagogue in Mincha Shel Shabbat. Two big rabbis. They call Rabbi Akiva Iger to go after Kohen and Levi. There's only three aliyot. They have to choose which one of the two rabbis will get an aliyah. They call Rabbi Akiva Iger. He, he fell on the floor and fainted from the embarrassment. Rabbi Yaakov Melissa realized why he fainted. He woke him up and he said, they didn't give you the aliyah because you're greater than me or a bigger Talmud Chacham because you're a rabbi of a big city and I'm a rabbi of a small city. They have to. That's why they gave you the aliyah. Well, oh, so, okay, good. Why, how can I go up when a big rabbi like this sitting over there and they give him, did not give him the aliyah? Rabbi Isaac Sher said that in his town there was two crazy people that were in a mental institution for 13 years. 13 years, shne meshugayim. Meshugine. One time a man named Cohen, Cohen, his last name, walked by the mental institution and heard one of the crazy per people talking to his friend and said, look who is here, Rabbi Cohen. The second one say, how can you dare to call him just Rabbi Cohen? You have to say the biggest genius tzaddik Rabbi Cohen, not just Rabbi Cohen. <laughs> Mr. Cohen went to his wife and said, remember the two crazy one, Yankel and Beryl? You should know there is a major improvement in their situation. <laughs> major improvement. 13 years nobody cared if they have any improvement. Let them rot in an institution, in a mental institution forever. As soon as they gave him a compliment, the important rabbi, he cannot see the truth anymore. Look how the bribe blinds a person. In one minute, he forgot that they're after all crazy. And whatever they say, it means nothing. Because it's such a nice compliment. Got the gaon, the tzaddik. That's what happened. The, the bribe blinds the chacham. He can't see the truth anymore. The Ben Yishchai say, one person had to leave his house 
to go make a living. When Yom Kippur arrived, he entered a synagogue and he said, let me find a tzaddik that I can sit next to him. To inspire me on Yom Kippur, maybe I'll get a bracha from him. He looked around, he saw one of the people crying, tears all over the floor. The floor is like a pool. Afar ani b'chayai, send I am in my life, needless to say when I die. I am a, 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 a shameful utensil in front of you, full of shame. Wow. Such a prayer. The Jew was so impressed by that guy. So, wow. Such a, such a humble man and such a tzaddik. I wish I can cry like this when I pray, he thought. Let me attach myself to this tzaddik. When the Aliyo came, they gave Cohen and Levi, and they came to him and said, you're going to go up Hamishi. Hamishi, by Sephardim, is Shishi, it's the best Aliyah. So, in Ashkenazim, Aliyah Shlishi, they usually give it to the Rabbi. When they told him, you get Aliyah Hamishi, what? You're not giving me Shlishi? Shame on you! What do you know from your life? I deserve that shlishi. You're embarrassing that Torah. By the end of Yom Kippur, the visitor came to him and said, Excuse me, I'm a little bit puzzled by your behavior. One minute you were dust and sand, and a minute later you scream at the Gabai like you full of ego and arrogance. How does it work together? He said, why don't you understand? When I speak to Ribbono Shalom, to Master of the Universe, I am a shameful utensil and sand and dust. But compared to the people over here, I'm a very important person. Compared to them. The Ben Ishchai said, the Gemara in Masechet Chulim, page 89, the Gemara said, what was written about Moshe and Aaron is greater than what's written about Abraham. By Abraham it's written, Anochi Afar Va'efer. Abraham say, I am a sand and I am dust. What's the difference between sand and dust? Ashes, I should say. Sand and ashes, what's the difference? Ashes, it's someone who used to have a nice legendary past, but it got burned. Nothing is left from it. I used to be somebody, but now I'm nothing. Sand is nothing now, but it can be somebody. You can build a whole building with that. It has potential to become something. Glass, nice glass. So Abraham say, I have no history of greatness, and I have no future. Moshe and Aaron say, and we are what? We are nothing, not even sand and ashes. Avraham that spoke with Hashem say, I am sand and ashes. And he was very humble. But Moshe spoke to the nation of Israel and say, we are nothing. So compared to the Jewish nation, Moshe and Aaron were the greatest by far. And they still felt they are nothing. When you speak to Hashem, how are you going to think you are something? It's not such a greatness like when you speak to, to, to a lot of losers around you and you compare yourself to them and make yourself less than them. I'm nothing. You are all better than me. And think that way. So when you are the greatest in a room and you make yourself the lowest, it's a much greater level than when you speak to Hashem and make yourself nothing. You understand the comparison here? Avraham spoke to Hashem and said, I'm sorry, I'm nothing, I'm not even sand and ashes. Oh, of course, compared to Hashem, we also would think the same. Not all of us. You know, one guy came to his uh, future uh, father-in-law after he dated his daughter a few times. The father-in-law, future father-in-law said to him, do you have plans where you're going to live after the marriage? So Hashem Yazor. Would you have a car at least, something to drive around? Hashem Yazor. 
you have money to buy a ring, Hashem Yazor. You have a suit for the wedding, Hashem Yazor. The, the rich man said to his wife in the kitchen, Sarah, I didn't know my name is Hashem. <laughs> Hashem Yazor, meaning you're going to pay for everything, Hashem Yazor. Unbelievable. Many of us, when someone rebuke us, time is running out, that's lasting for today. Many of us, when we hear someone rebuking us, the way we reply is, you're right, I'm not such a tzaddik. I admit, I'm not righteous. But there are others that are much worse than me. Why you pick on me? Right? From all the people over here you're attacking me, the people over here are much worse. The Magid Miduvna has a beautiful parable about this. When you live in a generation of everyone righteous around you, it's not such a greatness to be righteous as well. Everyone is righteous. There's no bad influence. But when you are Noah, everyone is wicked, and you are the only rose in a, in a desert full of thorns. The only rose there. The only righteous man. Noah is tzaddik bedorotav. So the, some of the Chachamim say, Noach deserve a great, a great Yeshar Koach. Why? He was righteous when everyone was wicked. Some say, no, it's the other way around. Compared to them, he was righteous. But if we'd be in the generation of Moshe or Abraham, it wouldn't be anything. Top. There's two ways to look at it. The Magid Miduvna say, if a person say, you know, he was, uh, he said when he comes to Shamaim to his trial, they say to him, why were you making all these sins? He said, listen, I'm not perfect. I'm not righteous. But look at the other people around me. They're all much, much worse than me. For, compared to them, I was a big tzaddik. They say, you're right. You're right. So... We're going to write you to be five months in a hospital. You're going to have to be now, that's your punishment, five months to be in bed in a hospital. Meaning you go out of business, you have big problems. When he will complain about the serious punishment, it's, I don't deserve such a punishment. They say to him, don't worry, there are people that are much worse than you. They get a year in a hospital. You only got five months. Meaning, there's two ways to compare. You say, I'm not the worst. Now, I'm not show me. When you will get your punishment, you say, how can you give me such punishment? Don't worry. Your punishment is nothing compared to what we give the others. Meaning, the arguments that you made is stupid. Why do you care if there's righteous around or wicked? You have to worry about your own soul. What can you excuse I live in a wicked by the way. Don't get me wrong, it will actually help. But you don't have to make that argument. Hashem already know where you grew up. If you came from Las Vegas or San Francisco, or you grew up in Meshaarim or, or Monty or I don't know, Lakewood. He knows where you're coming from. So someone who came from the garbage and became something is greater than someone who came from something and says something. You know, so the Kohen Gadol, he prays on Yom Kippur that Am Israel will all be righteous, not only compared to the Goyim, even when they compare them themselves, compare them to all the idol worshiper murderers, of course we're righteous compared to them. The idea is to be righteous by ourselves without comparison to them. So, when we pray in the Yamim Nuraim, we say to Hashem, Zochrenu lechaim, kotvenu besefer chaim, lemanach Elohim chaim. Do it for you. Write us in the book of life for yourself. I'm a soldier in your army. I want you to give me food, clothing. Why? For you. That I'll be able to serve you. What is it like? There is a soldier who came to his general, to his commander. He said, my mother is very old and sick, and I'm taking care of her. I just got an order to come to the army for 30 days in reserve. But I can't leave my mother for a month. I need you to have 
mercy on me and send me back home that I can take care of her. The general say, I understand, no problem. Here, you're allowed to go. No problem. He said to one of the other soldiers, I want you to follow him and check if, the, if he really has a sick mother and he's really taking care of her. Well, everyone will say it. We have to believe them. Go and check. The soldier came to the address that they had. He see a beautiful building in the north of Tel Aviv. He asked the doorman, Geveret Cohen lives here? He said, no, she doesn't live here, Bichlal. Who told you she's here? That's the address we have. So, he's wondering, where is she? In the old age somewhere. You know, he comes to the old age, to the nursing home. He says, hi, Mrs. Cohen, how are you? You okay? Yes, I'm here. I'm here alone. I'm not so okay. Do you have children? Yes, I have one son. But two years he didn't come to see me. He forgot I exist. After such a story, what will happen to that soldier? Not only is the freedom will be taken away, he's going to be punished for lying, right? This is us. We stand in the front of Hashem and Rosh Hashanah, or even every day. Please, Lemanach Hashem. Ase Lemanach, Ase Leman Toratach, Ase Leman Amitach, Ase Leman. We say all these words in the Slichot. Do it for you, not for me. I don't deserve anything. But if you give me, I'll be able to praise you. I'll be able to teach your Torah. I'll be able to save souls. I'll be able to give donations. This is what David Amelech said to Hashem. But there's a little bit difference between him and us. We say it, and he say it. But he kept it. What do we keep? David say, Ma betza bedami berideti el shachat. For those of you who read Tehilim, you know what I'm talking about. Ma betza, meaning what interest you have in my blood to bring me down to hell, meaning to kill me. Ma betza bedami berideti el shachat. Shachat is one of the seven places of hell. It's called Shaber shachat. So David said to Hashem in Tehilim, Ma betza bedami, what interest you have in my blood that you want to kill me? Descend, can praise you. Descend, can teach the world about your truth. No. If I'll become sand, I won't be able to continue to praise you. I won't be able to teach your Torah to the world. Why would you turn me into sand? A word for that. Because he was doing it every day. It wasn't a lie. We come to Hashem, give me money. For what? That I should sponsor your yeshiva. No, a million dollar came on a real estate deal. What does he do? Sponsoring the yeshiva? Sponsoring his boat. A boat. All of a sudden he wants $200,000 boat. And a summer house in a mountain. And a two hundred thousand dollars wedding. What happened to the yeshiva? <laughs> really took me serious. Lies like this have consequences. You may ask and say, "Wait a minute, Hashem, I'm not such a liar." I mean, yes, I didn't keep my promise. I admit, I can't lie. But when I actually ask you for millions because I wanted to sponsor the yeshiva or to, to make Baalei Tshuva, you know that I really meant it. If he really meant it, he's, he's enough to say, Hashem, you know when I actually requested the money, I actually really wanted to give. I really had the full intention. I was going to say, so the million dollar came. My mind forgot. My desire grew up. It could be that it's true. Many people, when they say, Rabbi, believe me, when I make money, you don't have to ask anyone for donations anymore. You just come to me, whatever you want. I'll give you an open check. <laughs> that reminds me about my friend, Alava Shalom. He was the best Jewish guitar player in history. Second best, maybe. Who was he? Yossi Piamenta. You know, you heard about him? 
He's a great guitar player. They even made an article about him in a Rolling Stones magazine. If you make it there, they write that you're one of the best guitar players. That means you're really good. And he, actually, after he became Baal Tshuva many years ago, Rav Mordechai Sharabi, the biggest legendary Kabbalist, made him a Baal Tshuva. He told me the story. How he found him in Yerushalayim on the street and started to talk to him. Rav Mordechai Sharabi, you look at him, it's hard for you to stay secular after you stay next to such giants. He made him a Baal Tshuva, and he had a handmade guitar that they don't make anymore. Very unique, with a very special sound. It's all handmade, wood guitar, with a very, very special sound. One time Chabad asked him to come play in a Shirut Rom. You know, they have this fundraising uh, once a year. So he came to play. And who they invited over there? One of the biggest musicians of our time, Bob Dylan, the Jew. His name is Zimmerman. Changed his name to a Goish name. Zimmerman, Bob Dylan. I think it's now past 80 by now. He's one of the richest and most successful rock and roll musicians. And Bob Dylan immediately recognized the guitar. He has a collection of guitars. Unique guitars, not just guitar, every guitar you go to the store and buy. It's all handmade, special. He, he took a check from his pocket, checkbook. He signed the check and he gave it to him. He said, write any amount you want. I want to live tonight with your guitar. Here, an open check. And I say to him, and you didn't take it? He said, what would I do? So he would write $100,000. He said, no, fine, and then what? My whole life is the guitar. <laughs> the sound, my specialty, uh, you take it away from me, it's like taking away my neshama. That reminded me now how some rich people, how poor people say, well, I'll, be, I'll give you an open check. Once they become rich, they don't remember your name. Now, if they go one day in front of Hashem, they will be too kind. Some of them never meant it to begin with. It was just, uh, you know, kalamfadi, beloni, dvarim betelim. And some really meant it. If you connect them to a light detector now, 10 years later, you became a millionaire. No, what happened to your promise? Ah, I have now so many expenses, you know, the family grew, and this and that, and I have investment, you have to wait a few years, he's going to make up excuses. Then you ask him, connected to a lie detector, at 10 years ago when you made that promise, did you really mean it? Absolutely. And the machine would show that he's not lying. So what happened? Very simple. When it was not Allah Khalemase, there was no need for the Satan, to come and fight him. There was no resistance, no Yetzirah. So the real, the real, Isaac, the real Isaac is dying to give charity. That's the real him. But as soon as the money came to his hand and now it became practical, meaning now it's time to give, immediately the Satan showed up. Isaac, you don't be stupid. What becomes five? The next half a million will be able to get two. Oh, actually, great idea. What's the rush? He survived until now and survive another five years. When it became five, so okay, now I have to keep my promise. Let me give the two. He means a bunch of. Don't you know money? But he gets left with three. And you have to marry each one of them a house. What are you going to do with three? You can even buy a house with three. Well, well, come on, it's not the time yet. Get to ten. Then, then, you know, you'll be able to do a lot more. You know, there's a, we'll finish with a good story. 
there is one big rabbi. Both of the people in the story passed away. I'm sure they're both in heaven in a very good place, those two. One was a Mexican billionaire, Jew, Syrian, from Mexico, and one was a Persian big holy rabbi, which was a pure pleasure to listen to his speeches because he was very, very interesting. He had great ideas. And when you speak, when you watch someone that is so holy and so righteous, it's not only the content of the lecture, is actually, you are impressed by the person, you enjoy every second. So what happened, Rabotai? This rabbi, his name was Rav Eliezer ben David, was the greatest Persian rabbi in the world. Allah shalom. A few years ago he passed. He came to this Syrian, back then he wasn't a billionaire yet. He was giving him money. He, Rav Eliezer ben David had 5,000 people that he used to pay them salary to learn all man Torah. 5,000 people. A few hundred dollars to each person, that's a big amount. He was one of the main donors. So he was giving him uh, money every month, a lot of money to pay all these guys to learn Torah. One time... Rav Eliezer ben David found out there is a bank in Argentina that giving 27% interest on your money. 20. Today, after all the increases, you get 2% if you're lucky. A year ago, you didn't get a quarter of a percent on your money. 27% like loan sharks. 27%. You don't have to work. Just pluck your money there and you make 27%. Why are you working? So he said to him, Rav Eliezer ben David, if you will put $50 million in a, in a bank account on your name, saving account, the money will be yours. Nobody has access to it besides you. I will be able to collect the interest and pay all the salaries from the interest on this $50 million. 27% on $50 million is how much money? Huh? 13.5 million. That would pay all the salaries of everyone. A few hundred dollars a person. Baruch Hashem. Your money will remain the same. No one will touch it. And you don't have to give me from your pocket. The interest of the bank will pay. Great plan, no? So, the, rabbi, the rich man agree. He, but at that time, he had $150 million worth. That was his worth. So he gave a third of what he had and locked it in that bank in Argentina. The bank paid two months interest and then the third month the owner of the bank took all the money that people put. It was all a scam to begin with. They, they put it all in trucks and overnight drove to Chile and disappeared with all the cash. Bank went bankrupt overnight. Go and find it out. The poor rabbi had to call that rich man and tell him what just happened. Imagine the embarrassment. He called him up and said, Mr. Moshe, I don't know how to even say it. The advice I gave you was a horrible advice, apparently. I, I meant well, but look, the people of the bank stole all the money and disappeared, and there's no way to find it. Your $50 million are all gone. This was over 30 years ago. 50 million back then was like 200 million today. Well, it was a lot of money. The rich man just in a minute lost a third of what he had. And it's a big amount of money. He said to him, don't worry, Rabbi. Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yehi Shem Hashem Evorach. Hashem gave me the money. Hashem took away the money. The name of Hashem should always be blessed. That was his answer. I will continue to give you the same amount of donation that I used, as I was giving you before. Shortly after, someone came to him and said to him, would you like to buy a TV channel in Mexico? They're going bankrupt. The price... Is few million dollars, very cheap. Just buy the equipment, they bankrupt. Yes, he went and bought that channel. 
few years later he sold it for 10 billion dollars. Few years. Shem made that channel go up to the sky, Mexican channel, sports, this, that. Sold it for 10 billion. What do you see? There is tests in life that if you pass them, you will find out what you just gained. If you fail them, you will never know what you lost until you die. All of us are going into a huge, huge surprise when we die. Some of us for good, some of us for bad. Some of us will see the few tests that Hashem gave us in our life and we fail those tests and He will show us the consequences of our bad choices, what we could have gained and what we gained in the end. And we will pull our hair off. It's going to kill us. It's going to be a, 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 not just death sentence, it will be a killer to know, wow, I almost did it. In the last minute, the Yetzirah crushed me. Look what I lost. It will affect you for eternity. Eternity. Or if you did it, now you see what you gain. Ah, you feel so great. Wow, I'm so lucky I did it. I did it right. Some of us will have a wonderful surprise when we find out what came out of our donations. I'm sure all of you donate. Some of you donate to my Kiruv, divineinformation.com. You donate monthly, you know, whatever it is, monthly automatic recurring donation. You don't even pay attention to it. 100, 200, 50, whatever it is. It keeps coming out every month. You pay your credit card bill, you don't even pay attention. After years, it accumulates to a few thousand dollars. One day you come to Shamaim, and all of a sudden you find out that you have uh, 700 religious, unbelievable children. 700 children? Barely had two kids and, and a dog making a lot of noise in my backyard in Fresh Meadow. Where did you get me all these 700 kids? Peot, Kipot, like this, with Gmarot. Who are these people? Uh, look at me, I'm a moderny. Modern, look at my pink shirt. Look at my blorit. Look at my uh, $30,000 watch and a nice Mercedes and the show off that I did in the streets of Queens. Where these religious kids came from? From what you from promoting lectures, from giving out USBs, from ending books, from uh, you know, promoting all kinds of lectures. How many people are changing? You have no idea. And then you will meet them. Sometimes you won't even know. You may be 80 years old, and you find out there's a big Baal Tshuva Rabbi. I'll give you an example. There's a big star in Israel, Rav Meir Eliyahu. Super computer brain. He can tell you thousands of pages by heart, word by word, photographic memory. Twenty something years Baal Tshuva. I had the schut Baruch Hashem to bring him closer to Torah and Mitzvot in the beginning. And his brother was in our yeshiva here in Monsi. But after that he went to Rav Ben Pura to his yeshiva and grew up in Torah. Sometimes a person like this, there's a lot of genius Baal Tshuva in the yeshivot, thousands. Some of them can be yours, you don't know. They watch the lecture, they walk them up. When I was in Israel a few months ago, one guy came to me, tzitziot out, little beard, big kippah. He told me I was one of the most important soldiers in Israeli army intelligence, in the most advanced intelligence unit, Shmone Matayim, those who spy on Iran, and spy on all the big uh, terrorists that you find. That's who I was. Super genius in computers, in tracking people, in all kinds of, uh, what's the name of it, cyber. Genius in cyber. I can't even tell you the operation I participated in. One time, one person gave me a CD, The Purpose of Life, in Hebrew. I looked at that, I got curious. I saw a nice design, color. I put it in my laptop, in my break. I started to listen. I skipped. I just want to see what this is about. Once I skipped, 
I heard one sentence you say. One Some people would live their entire life, and when they finish their life, age 80, they will find out that they didn't even touch the purpose of their life. They never know what the purpose of their life. They don't know what they live for. After I heard that sentence, it made me think, I know so many things. I read so many books. I know any software, apps, computers. That most people have no idea what it is. So many, I'm such a genius. The Israeli army admires me. And I don't even know what I live for. What's the purpose of my life? It's right. It's, it's, this is what I was like. I'm one of those who don't know what I'm living for. So I started to listen to the old CD. Then I started to listen to other lectures. And look at me now. I'm completely Haredi. Somebody sponsored that CD. Then this genius guy now is learning Torah every day. Become somebody big. That dollar that that CD cost could have been one of yours. It's, it wasn't that long ago. A few months ago, I found out about him, and he became Baal Tshuva a few months earlier. So we're talking maximum two years ago. Someone that made a donation approximately two years ago, one of the donation created that CD. Who created that guy? Just think about it. He's going to get married, or maybe he's already married. And he will have children in yeshivot, and grandchildren, and grand-grandchildren. By the time you'll be 80, he may have already 50 people under him, all, all religious in yeshivot. And you come to the next world, and you find out that you're a very wealthy man. Even though you were not such a great religious guy, or very modern and corrupted in many ways. But you got lucky, you made a good investment. A lot of stupid people made good investment, became billionaires. Not because they're great, they're bright. They just made, they were the right, in the right place in the right time. And they did it. And they did it. You understand? So what is it? The choices are beyond words. If to do it right, not to do it right, to become Ben Torah, to enter Yeshiva. How many boys did not go to Yeshiva in Israel and be, did not become serious? And then they became completely secular and destroyed their future. And other kids went and they sat two, three years in Jerusalem and learned and grew up in Ruchniut. They came back, got married, have a wonderful family later on. It's a decision of a moment. He either agree and he gets on a plane and go to yeshiva, struggle a week or two or three, and then gets into the atmosphere of, and become somebody big, or becomes another American loser, like many millions others. They have no purpose for their future. Nothing. It's a moment. A moment that changes every, change everything. A moment that you choose who to marry will affect your eternity. The moment that you choose what kind of a job to go in will it change your eternity. The moment you choose where to put your child in what school, what yeshiva, will change your eternity. The moment you decide to write a big check, to where to write it? To a foreign place that you're going to get punished for every penny you gave them? Or to a place who really does a holy work? Both of them count donations. You deduct both of them. Give it to the church of the reform, if you call them Jews, Bichlal. Or give it to a holy place. It's Shamayim Var, it's nothing to compare. Here it's a diamond, here it's Arconia, that's it. Very simple. Two people went to buy a 10 carat diamond. They both paid 10 million dollars. One got a real diamond, a great one, worth the money, and the other one got a fake, or a fake uh, Russian fake, uh, fake diamond. Glass. They fooled him. They both invested. One got something, one got nothing. That's not so bad. Okay, you got nothing. You lost the money. But giving to reform, you're going to be punished for every penny and whatever came out of it. Not only you didn't get 
You lost everything you ever had and more. Look at all these bombastic reforms, synagogues, with all the names and all kinds of American people who gave money. They think they did something great for their parents. They don't know that their parents suffer every second for that, for what's happening in those churches. Intermarry, gays marriage, all this nonsense that happened in these filthy places. There's a reason why you're not allowed to step one step inside. You're not allowed to stand. To change a light bulb as an electrician, you're not allowed to enter. You can enter a, a reform synagogue, but you're allowed to enter a mosque. If you're an electrician, there's a work in a mosque, you're allowed to fix it. But you're not allowed to enter a reform synagogue. It's worse than a mosque. Think about it. <laughs> it's allowed to pass by. There's rain, you want to go inside to hide from the rain. You have no place to pray and it's raining outside, you're allowed to go inside and pray. Reform synagogue, you're not allowed to put one foot inside. Why? The biggest criminals in the world are those people who modify the Torah completely and destroy it. And they claim rights. We want to get the Western wall. We want to convert. Convert who you call him. Since we want to Judaism. Almost all of them are going. The seven, eight generations assimilate. They don't even know who their grandparents are. They're all married non-Jews for almost 200 years. You yourself is a goy. 99.9% .9 you're not Jewish. How do you want rights to convert others when you don't know from the keep? And even if you keep people, it doesn't help you. So what is going to help you? We're not obligated. You can convert. That's the fakeness of the way. And I keep telling people, lower your profile, don't attract attention. Every second you hear, this guy got robbed, this one, all these people are in a very high risk, either to get robbed or to get killed. This lousy watch will get you killed. It's no joke. No joke. Every day I hear about people who get robbed. They steal watches now. Watches have high value now. They cost triple than what they were a year ago, three years ago, whatever. People come with guns, have nothing to lose, all this drug addict, all these people who don't make a living, especially after COVID. They all got used to lay down and get weekly checked. Bums. You expect them to go back to work now for $500 a week? You're out of your mind? They'll kill their own mother and they won't come back to work. After you spoil them like a year and a half getting pay weekly checks, the weekly checks they were getting is more than what they were making working like slaves. Ask them now to go back to work in a supermarket or, or in UPS or in the boxes and lift things or, or cut grass in 90 degrees. Let's see. They, want, they would rather die. So what happened when the money ran? They'll put a gun to someone's head. What do they have to lose? Every other one of them has a gun. Guns are, you know, and you buy it. That's what's happening. So you have to be very careful. Don't go with too much cash on you. Write down the name and the telephone numbers of all the credit cards that you have. Write down the numbers and the, and the 800 numbers that if you get robbed, they steal your wallet or the credit card, you know immediately to run and call and cancel them. Because if they're going to steal your phone, and they will steal your wallet, you won't even remember what credit cards you have and where to call. It's going to take you hours. By then, they can charge who knows what. You have to respond quickly. Be ready. There is a massive amount of crime now. Massive. Every minute, robbery, stores, guns, banks. Who knows? Especially they're attacking people. Women, old people. They wait for people in the middle of the night when they come by the driveway. As soon as he comes, they already know in advance. They wait, two of them come, they beat him up, they steal everything. You see, I see every day videos like this. From around here. Every day robberies. So you got to be very careful. 
And plus, when you daven, ask Hashem every morning to save you when you, when you think about mi yetzerah, mi aynara, ben shu ben brit, u ben sheno brit, you have to have in, a lot of kavana. And Hashem save you with all kinds of bad things that comes to the world. And Bezrat Hashem will survive and hope that Mashiach will come and save us from this misery. Baruch Adonai le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Abichanani, Amen. Akashia Omer. Ratzah, Kadosh Bachur.